Hey folks, and welcome to another edition of Zog Science. Uh, today we're going to be continuing our discussion of cell respiration by following the things that we made in glycolysis on into the mitochondria. So um, pyruvate is taken from the process of glycolysis, and it is going to be transported into the mitochondria. As it's being transported into the mitochondria, it's going to kick off a CO2. Um, it is also going to produce an NADH. And then finally, uh, uh, coenzyme A is going to be added to it, and we're going to produce the molecule called acetyl-CoA. So we went from a three-carbon molecule down to a two-carbon molecule. Um, and that is then going to enter into the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle. Uh, and this process only is going to move forward in the presence of oxygen. It requires oxygen in order to make, sh uh, make certain that that happens. So what you have to remember about this cycle is that it is a cycle. So what that means is that the uh, molecules that uh, had ended the cycle before have now joined in from that cycle, right? So there was a cycle that was occurring. You have a molecule that's produced at the end of that cycle. The acetyl-CoA is going to be brought in and is going to attach into that cycle. So as we take a look at this, um, the first molecule that is produced is called citrate which is why this is called the citric acid cycle. Uh, the next molecule that is produced is isocitrate. Uh, we've got some water that's kind of being used to help rearrange that. We're then going to produce our first NADH molecules as well as our first CO2 molecules from this process. Uh, we're going to get another CO2 and another NADH being formed. Uh, we're going to have some ATP being formed uh, that's using GTP and GDP as a kind of inter, uh, intermediary there. Um, we're going to add an FADH2, which, remember, is another one of our electron carriers. Uh, we're going to add some water. Uh, and then finally, we're going to make another NADH. So we're producing a lot of things here. And all of these things are being produced from a, an, a, a single acetyl-CoA, which, remember, is coming from a single pyruvate. If you recall, we're going to actually have two molecules of pyruvate being formed for each molecule of glycolysis. So in reality, we actually get six NADH, we get four CO2, two ATP, and two FADH being produced for each molecule of glucose. So again, for one molecule of glucose, if we look at glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we've got two, uh, four ATPs, two hydrogens, two H2Os, uh, uh, eight NADHs, six CO2s, and two FADH2s. So you'll notice that we've only produced a little bit of ATP so far, right? Like only four molecules. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, that's not that much more, more of an improvement. So the question is now, where is most of this energy being stored that is taken out of the glucose? Well, most of it um, is being turned into NADH and FADH2, which are going to help carry electrons to the electron transport chain, which we are going to use to get that energy back out and turn it into ATP. Uh, the electron transport chain is a collection of molecules that are embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. So remember, mitochondria are made up of a double membrane. We've got the outer membrane and then the inner membrane. These molecules are located inside the inner membrane. Um, the cell membrane for aerobic uh, prokaryotes is very similar to this inner membrane, which is another one of our pieces of evidence that helps to support the endosymbiotic theory. What's going to be happening is that electrons are going to be dropped off by the NADH and the FADH2, um, and they are going to require oxygen in order to function properly. So how does it kind of work overall? Well, electrons are going to flow through the proteins in the chain, and they're going to do so because of increasing electronegativity of each molecule. So where they're dropped off has the lowest electronegativity, and every single subsequent molecule has higher electronegativities as you move down the chain. As they are moving through, protons are going to be pumped into the intermembrane space. So the, there is a collection of protons that are on the, in, uh, on the inside of the inner membrane. And those are going to be pumped into the intermembrane space, or the space between the inner and the outer membranes. Um, the oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain is going to accept those electrons, and it's going to be converted into H2O. So that's kind of us talking about it. Let's take a look at how this actually will happen, all right? So what we have is we have um, NADH dropping off uh, electrons over here at the very beginning. Uh, FADH2 also drops off electrons, but it drops them off at a little bit of a different spot. Uh, and so FADH2 actually produces a little bit less, uh, less ATP than NADH because it drops them off a little bit later down the pathway. So we get less motive force being formed. And I'll talk about what that is in just a moment. Um, 
the NAD plus and the FAD are then recycled back to glycolysis and the Krebs cycle uh, in order to continue those cycles on. So the electrons are going to be passed down the chain. As then again, as they're being passed down the chain, they're moving from one protein to another in levels of increasing um, electronegativity. Eventually, oxygen is going to be here at the end. It's going to accept those electrons and uh, add it with a couple of hydrogens in order to form water, which is one of our byproducts of cellular respiration. How this actually does work, okay? The movement of the electrons is pumping the protons from the matrix, which is on the inside of the uh, of the mitochondria into the inner intermembrane space, which is between the two membranes. And what we're doing is we're creating a high concentration of hydrogen in that uh, space. The hydrogen is going to be then allowed to move back across, right? Because we have diffusion wants to occur. It wants to go from areas of high to low pressure. But the only place that it can move across the intermembrane, um, or it, it, the only place that it can move back into the matrix is through ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is a protein that facilitates the transformation of ADP and phosphate into ATP. And that is the process what we, that we call chemiosmosis. We use osmosis to help facilitate this chemical process. And this uh, force that is called the proton motive force. And it's because we have created this high concentration of protons on one side of the membrane that drives the ATP synthase to then produce ATP. There is one protein from this process that you should remember, and that's this one right here, cytochrome C. It's not that you necessarily need to know what cytochrome, what cytochrome C like does specifically as a part of the electron transport chain, but it's important to know it because it's used in a lot of evolutionary studies. Uh, cytochrome C is very highly conserved across species. What that means is that it does pretty much the exact same thing, and it has very similar um very similar, similar structure across lots of different species. And so it's, it's used a lot in genetics and evolutionary studies. Um, so it's important to kind of remember it as something, that, as a protein um, and, a, and a gene that are very important. So let's talk about what's going on in chemiosmosis. In the intermembrane space, we have produced this uh, proton gradient where we have a high concentration of protein, protons uh, in that intermembrane space. Those protons are then allowed to move through uh, the ATP synthase, which helps to drive it forward. You don't need to know all the little pieces here. You just need to understand the main concept of what's going on. Um, but we drive the ATP synthase forward. The ATP synthase then takes ADP and a phosphate and combines them together into ATP. And this is where we get all of our molecules of ATP that make uh, aerobic respiration so much more effective at producing energy as opposed to uh, anaerobic respiration or fermentation. So, that's all there is uh, for this for this uh, for this video. In the next one, we will uh, kind of wrap things up and talk a little bit about some of the evolutionary trends that we see. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.